Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We'll uh, just wait one or two more minutes while we admit the rest of uh, the attendees from the, the waiting room. I like your background, Simon. Thank you. Nice. Even has a rainbow. Has a double rainbow, actually. Double rainbow, even better. I guess I didn't see that. Santa and I are both, uh, we're sparring. One is the, the Bodleian at Oxford. Uh, mine is the college where uh, I did my undergraduate in Cambridge at Emmanuel. So. Um, just scrolling through my uh, my film strip of faces at the uh, at the side of the projected slide. It's lovely to see everyone, even in miniature um, Hollywood squares. Okay, well, I think I'll uh, kick us off this afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone, once again, thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to this virtual celebration of teaching excellence at UBC. Um, I know most of you, it's nice to see all of you. For those of you I don't know or don't know me, I'm Simon Bates, I'm the Associate Provost Teaching and Learning and a faculty member, professor of teaching in the Department of Physics and Astronomy on the Vancouver campus. Uh, just before we start today, uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that UBC's two main campuses are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam people for the Point Grey campus and the Okanagan peoples for the Kelowna campus. I'd also like to acknowledge that all of us are joining today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands where we're joining from. So I have just a few housekeeping comments and then uh, I'll hand over to President Santa Ono. Delighted that Santa's able to host this event for us. Also equally delighted that Wendy Yip, University Ambassador, is able to join us today. And I'll hand over to Santa in just a couple of moments. Uh, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we've muted everyone by default. Uh, we have a series of short presentations from people. So when it is your turn to shine in the spotlight, please uh, unmute yourself. If you're having any technical difficulties, that's anyone in the, in the, in the meeting. Uh, we are monitoring the, uh, the group chat. Uh, so please feel free to shoot any questions or comments off there. Uh, we would love to see everyone on video, uh, but recognize that some of you may choose to be hidden or may want to, uh, to turn your video off, so that's absolutely fine. Uh, we're, we're here to, and gathered to really celebrate excellence in teaching at UBC, uh, and I wanted to, to offer my thanks and appreciation to all of you at this time, particularly at this time, for the, uh, the ways in which that we are all adapting our teaching, we're redesigning our courses, and we're rethinking how we can engage students in courses that are running over the summer and over the fall. I know you and many of your colleagues are uh, deeply enmeshed in that work, and will be over the summer months. Uh, but I think particularly for the group of outstanding educators we've got gathered here today, uh, you really are uh, examples, you are leaders amongst your peers, and I'm sure you're being drawn on in both formal and informal capacities to, uh, to support teaching in all its forms at UBC. So with that, I'll hand over to UBC President Santorino to make some opening remarks. 
Thank you very much, Simon. And it's uh, wonderful to connect with all of you virtually. Um, this is a very important occasion for the university, the second annual celebration of teaching excellence at UBC. And uh, Liz King told me that this is the very first event uh, that would have taken place on this day at this time at Norman Mackenzie House. And I think I speak for Wendy as well in saying that uh, we regret that we can't actually host you at Norman Mackenzie House today, but we very much uh, want to be part of this celebration and also look forward to the third annual celebration of teaching excellence at UBC one year from now. The reason why this is so important is that uh, one of the most important parts, you could even argue maybe the most important part of what we do as a university is teaching. And this is uh, the, the day each year that we honor our outstanding teachers. And it's very difficult uh, to honor everyone because so many members of our faculty are truly committed and outstanding and innovative in their, in their teaching. Uh, we are here to honor virtually UBC's Teaching Excellence, in particular the recipients of the 3M Award, the Killam Teaching Prize, and the Professors of Teaching and Teaching Excellence and Innovation Award recipients. And I understand that there'll be 19 presentations today, and I'm very much looking forward to each of them. I know that they're relatively brief, but uh, it will really be a tour de force of excellence in teaching at the university. I also want to take this opportunity to thank you for all of your passion and your devotion to the educational mission at UBC, the way that you support our students and each other uh, each and every day of the year. And I also wanted to say that this has been an extraordinary year in many respects. And what has really kept the institution together, and I was just, I should say, I just left a town hall meeting of students uh, and uh, students from both campuses. And uh, uh, one of the questions was, what is, what is it about the university uh, that is dear to you. And one of the things that uh, was mentioned frequently in responses was the dedication of the faculty members to teaching excellence. So don't underestimate how important you are, not only to the education of our students, but also to their fe feeling of belonging. Uh, and for that, uh, I want to be especially thankful to each and every one of you for being who you are and making you see the institution that it, is, that it is. And I know that you are very hard at work as we prepare for September, and um, that, that it's a heavy lift to not only innovate and to teach at the highest level, but to really transition to online uh, instruction. So your work, your skills, your passion, your caring for the students of this institution are more important than ever before. I'm looking forward to hearing from you, and I'll turn things back to Simon uh, to introduce the 19 speakers. Thank you, Santa, for those remarks and the, uh, the, those acknowledgements. Uh, so it's, it's my pleasure now to move to uh, what I hope will be an interactive and engaging segment of uh, this event. Uh, when you were invited uh, in the best tradition, you were set some homework or maybe some pre-work before class. Uh, and we invited you to submit one slide from your teaching that really exemplifies what you do and how you do it, why you chose that slide, what you think it conveys about students, your approach, your pedagogy, your ethos for teaching, and how you feel it supports student learning. Um, so the ones that were, were submitted have been graded. No, only joking. We're not going to grade them. Everyone gets an A. Um, but what we have done is we've put together uh, a presentation with each of those um, 19 slides. Uh, and what we're going to try and do is invite each presenter to present their slide. You'll have one minute to present, and I will have to be ruthless in my approach to timekeeping because as well as the presentation we want the opportunity for a little bit of discussion as well so the general rhythm will be a minute to present after your minute i will start waving and gesticulating politely but insistently that it's time to stop uh, and then we'll have the opportunity to take 
I think just one question for each speaker. So that's another request. Uh, as you listen to these presentations, please do use the group chat to pose your question to the speaker. Could be a thought, question, comment, anything you'd like to share. We obviously won't be able to get to all of them, uh, but Carissa will pick one of them to ask each presenter. And with a bit of luck, we'll have some time at the end for some general questions and comments. So I would ask speakers, I think you know the order, or at least you should know the order in which you're presenting. We shared the slide deck with you uh, in advance. Everyone is muted by default, so if I could just remind speakers to unmute yourself when it's your turn for the presentation. So we'll get going. I'm delighted to introduce uh, my colleague for, from the Faculty of Science, uh, Joanne Fox, who is going to kick us off. Over to you, Joanne. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, man, it's so good to see your faces. Uh, so many friends. I miss you so much. Uh, uh, seeing you all together in one space uh, realize it makes me realize how much I miss you. So I, I hope you're doing well and keeping uh, you and your family are all keeping well in these very strange times. I was asked why I chose this slide and you'll notice that I didn't submit a slide. And that was intentional because I don't use slides in, in my class. I submitted um, a, a picture because my class is a first year seminar where student discussion and other student centered uh, activities really drive the content. Um, what was I aiming to convey with this picture? Uh, you'll see that there's students uh, at the center of the picture, which I believe to be fundamentally important. It does show me in the background, um, and I am sort of trying to convey that that's my role, is that I'm there as a facilitator, I'm there as a guide for learning. Um, in this uh, class, students learn from each other um, and they learn from engaging in the learning environment that we have very carefully uh, constructed. I also like this picture because it shows two science students doing peer review of each other's uh, writing. Uh, so this is Henry and Zoe and they are reviewing uh, their writing. And we have shown and published on how this unique first year seminar setting uh, results in significant learning gains, specifically in first year science students' abilities to uh, improve their writing skills and construct their own evidence-based arguments. That's my one minute. Thank you, Joanne. I am going to have such a hard time just <laughs> cutting off friends and colleagues like this. Um, well, Joanne, I'm not going to let you escape without a question. Uh, I will ask the, uh, the, the, the first question, but again, if I can uh, just ask people, please do put your questions uh, in the chat. I know you don't have a long time to think about them. So Joanne, if I could ask you, um, what do you feel, what, what's the biggest challenge in reimagining this course for the fall, given that you'll not have the opportunity of those two students sitting side by side? Yeah, I think it's thinking about asynchronous engagement. So it's, uh, we're used to that face-to-face -face engagement and I have a lot of skills and a whole little toolkit that I can reach into uh, to facilitate those face-to-face -face conversations. So I'm reaching further when I think about how do I create those kinds of using fostering engagement in online spaces. So I've taken a lot of, uh, we have a lot of creative thinking happening on that front. Um, and uh, fortunately I'll teach this in term two, so we'll, We'll see. <laughs> so at the very least, you've got a bit more time to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, I'm going to turn now next to Cheryl Sigarek. Cheryl. Thank you, Simon. I just would like to start by saying that it is a real pleasure and honor to be here this afternoon and to share this, this celebration with all of you. Um, I realize how quick a minute goes, so I'll get right down to it. Um, I just would like to say that with regard to this slide, it is also, I also elected to not use a, a slide per se. I don't use them in my seminar uh, courses. Um, and uh, I'll start by saying that I really believe that uh, learning is what happens when we engage with self and others um, and our environment. Um, and that self knowledge is really socially created. So with that in mind, this is, these are actually photographs taken from the classroom. Um, and this is in a, a, 
it combined with some critical reflective questions that I use to stimulate discussion uh, uh, between myself and the students, uh, asking them to really reflect on their practice. These are professional students who are uh, entering into the uh, Masters uh, in Health Leadership program, which is a joint venture between the Sauter School of Business and the School of Nursing. It's a very unique program. Uh, so these are already accomplished practitioners who are coming back to learn leadership skills. They're very highly engaged in um, projects that involve elements of curriculum development and delivery. So it's important for them to reflect on who they are as teachers. Uh, it's something that often they haven't really thought about at all. So uh, they find this quite interesting. Um, and to think about how that influences the, their decision around curriculum design and how they engage with, um, with students. And I'm up for time. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Um, this is the hardest bit about emceeing this event this afternoon is is cutting people off. Um, okay. okay, we have a question from Susan. Do your students share your understanding of what is learning and teaching, or do you need to convince them of your view? Oh, what a great question. Um, I, I, <laughs> the whole idea behind this is to share multiple perspectives about what it is to be a teacher. Um, how do we know, um, you know, what what kind of a teacher we are, what our philosophy of teaching and learning really is. So we engage in an active discussion and sometimes um, we find similarities and sometimes uh, we agree to disagree um, and, and find differences across, but find value in all of the different approaches and how um, you know, one approach or one way of thinking about teaching and or learning is applicable in certain contexts and not so much in others. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Cheryl, and, and thank you, Susan. I was not looking forward to asking 19 questions. So I'm glad that we've now got the ball rolling and they're coming in in the, uh, in the chat. Okay, next up, Karen Ragunandan. Ragunandan, yes. So I'm from uh, the Okanagan campus and I'm presently teaching this course, Education for the Whole Person, to 126 students via Zoom. This is usually an experiential course which focuses on a holistic approach to wellness, so looking at physical, emotional, uh, mental health uh, wellness. I'm team teaching it as well and we've had to adapt it really, really fast, um, you know, for online delivery. Um, you can see the little infograph is representative of the Okanagan School of Education, you know, just our approach to teaching. It's based on a community of scholar practitioners, so ensuring that all our teaching approaches are evidence-based, they're anchored in equity, diversity, and inclusion. And last and not least, uh, we have uh, had to add, uh, we wanted to, uh, create community online. And the way we do it is uh, through uh, humor. So who's Zoom and who? Sometimes we play, you know, the Queen of Souls a seminal song from 1985. Not a lot of BED students know it. And I also found these great little slides from uh, the Comedy Wildlife Photography Award. So oftentimes, instead of having a waiting room, I will just flow through the slides and just create just a little bit of sense of community for students before we actually start our courses. Thanks, Simon. That's brilliant, thank you. And, and I, I don't know if you planned that, but that was bang on one minute. It was an <laughs> exemplary piece of, uh, piece of time keeping. Um, and a question from Christina. What is the usual experimental approach to this course that you weren't able to do? Yeah, so the course itself, so I teach a series of mindfulness exercises. So looking at breathing exercises, looking at mindful movement, for example, um, taking them outdoors and doing hikes and seeing how we can use nature to, you know, to, to, um, to inform our practice. So we've had to do a lot of those online and I've simply recorded myself via podcast using Kaltura. Um, I've sent them to websites, you know, for the hikes and just tried to support them in their learning um, as they're going along. We have regular check-ins as well. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, the clarity and the succinctness of the answers. I know it's challenging to both present this information uh, so, so rapidly and also to answer a question that you would probably love to be able to talk for, uh, for five minutes on, but I appreciate the, uh, the responses. Okay, next up. Alan Sens. Welcome, Alan. Hello, Simon. Thank you. And great seeing everybody. 
Um, so this is from a course that's actually team taught. It's a course on nuclear weapons and arm cons arms control, political science and applied science. So there are engineers and art students in the class. It's co-taught myself and Matt Yedlin from electrical and computer engineering. And what we've done with this course is we flipped it. It's a hundred percent flipped classroom. And so all the activities in the course are peer engagement with Matt and I there as facilitators. And I chose this because I'm a big fan of simulations, of, of actually embedding students into a situation where they have to act uh, in ways that not only animate the learning material, but also place them in situations that they have to problem solve their ways out of it as collectives. So 12 groups, 12 countries, and this is a slide from the actual classroom um, instructions about the process, and this is how you can do a simulation in one class if you show, if you show uh, choose. So great advantage here, peer engagement within groups and peer engagement across groups. And the deliverable is the two written components of the assignment, which are for grade at the end of the class. It's another opportunity for them to animate the materials. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Alan. I, I was Go ahead. What is the biggest challenge to implementing your flipped classroom online? Um, I can't really answer that because we haven't started yet. Um, my biggest fear uh, is that the courses that are flipped actually have a very unique set of challenges because they were exclusively designed to promote peer-to-peer -peer learning and instructor facilitation. So for this particular assignment, I know we can do the group, the within the group engagement. So each group of students playing a country can go into a breakout room. Exactly how we're going to manage the diplomacy section, which was discussion between the countries, between the groups, is gonna be a very interesting challenge with 12 groups of students. Yeah, certainly is, thank you. Uh, next, Margot, Margot Filipenko. Uh, thanks, and uh, thanks for inviting me here today. Um, first of all, this is really a bit of a cheat because um, I teach a range of courses, but everybody loves children's literature, so this seemed to be the obvious uh, slide and course for me to share with you. Um, the slide is from um, author-illustrator Anthony Brown, who's one of my favorites, um, and it's in a simple and humorous way, um, the book cover begins to illustrate perfectly the complex interplay between text and image. And that's kind of the focus of this particular course. And um, it's a way of beginning to tease out from students what they already know uh, tacitly about the way that text and image works. Um, for example, uh, these three characters on the back of this poor woman um, are all looking at us. It's a demand. So we kind of know that. So the students begin to think about that. Uh, students who take the course are primarily teachers and teach librarians working with children and youth. Uh, the course builds on the notion that in today's world, children and youth need to navigate images as carriers of meaning. And in the best picture, uh, picture text and image, in the best picture books, text and image dance together in the meaning making process. And I want the students to kind of think about that in these range of, of picture books. A critical approach toward multi, multimodal text enables children and youth to actively and critically participate in the wider social power structures reflected and created within a text. In this case, gender inequality explored in Anthony Brown's wonderful and provocative piggy book. So in this course, we really um, come together to look at uh, picture books, we look at texts, we look at image, we look at the theoretical underpinnings, of text and image and really explore the ways that we can uh, surface children's understandings of what it is they're looking at in these seemingly simple books, but actually ultimately very complex books. I think I took my minute. You did, thank you very much, Margot. Okay, we have, uh, we have no questions submitted, but certainly some uh, lively other comments in the, uh, in, in the chat about uh, the mechanics of dividing students up into, uh, into groups. Okay, we will uh, move on. Ramon Lawrence, Computer Science, UBCO. 
Hi, Raymond here. Thank you, everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, the slide I chose today is not a slide from a particular course. It's a slide I do for every course. The one I've actually chose is the Master of Data Science. It's a professional program that's both at Vancouver and Okanagan. And this slide will be presented normally within the first 10 minutes of a class because I always want to answer the question, why are you here? What are you going to get out of this course? What is it important for you? For in this case, this is all about building skills and encouraging them to buy in to putting the time in to build the skills. The other piece of the slide in the very bottom paragraph is convincing them that I'm there for them. I'm going to really encourage and support their learning. I really care. And then especially the last part, I strive for all students to achieve their goals. Sometimes undergrad students in big classes think they're just the number. And I want to make it very clear right from that first class in the first 15 minutes that I'm there for you and this material is important for you. So I really hope you engage with it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I wonder if I could um, ask you a question about that final paragraph. Uh, I think many of us um, have that kind of aspiration for every single one of our students. Uh, are there things that you do periodically throughout the course to reinforce that message? Because what I've found personally is sometimes students need to hear that more than once and they need to hear it at different times in the course. Often the most important time after the first class is when they get a midterm or graded assignment back and you have those communications some, and in a positive way, defining what success is. Everyone's success isn't an A, but you want to make sure that they feel that you're contributing to help them with their success. And then just having any form of open door, electronic communication possible so they feel comfortable talking to you at any time. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe, if I may, seeing as we've got a couple of other questions in, uh, Carissa, could you pick one uh, other from the ones we've had in? What do you do for those who aren't convinced? Well, what you're not seeing here is there's a whole bunch of interactive clicker questions that come along with this, asking them why they care about this. Actually, one of the best ones is I ask them what mark they plan to get. And almost all of them say they're planning to get an A, but that causes a good discussion point on what their goals are and what my goals are. And then you just keep building that. I've taught for a long time. It's always that first class I'm nervous because you're kind of setting the tone. And then you just want to keep following that up every time you get up in front and talk to them. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up, Wendy, Wendy Carr. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and what a terrific variety of um, areas of focus and scholarship and teaching. I, I'm just fascinated. And it's always, I love these cross faculty uh, get together. So thank you. Um, this is actually a cover slide from our website. Uh, in the Faculty of Education, we mobilize knowledge. And we've been endeavoring to develop mental health literacy among our, all of our pre service teachers in the teacher education program that's over 700 a year, as well as the provinces in service teachers in every school district throughout multiple institutes. So we have reached every district um, through our mental health literacy education with one in five youth worldwide experiencing a mental illness before they turn 25. Uh, educators play a vital role, particularly if they have the necessary knowledge, attitudes and skills that comprise mental health literacy. And so to really extend our knowledge mobilization efforts, we created two MOOCs uh, to develop mental health literacy in educators at both pre-service and in-service level. Um, so learn is, one of them is called learn and the other is called teach. And uh, teach has an actual mental health curriculum that educators can take into the classroom. So these MOOCs actually provide asynchronous learning opportunities and resources. Uh, that support educators or anyone really who wishes to increase their mental health literacy uh, in having an influence on their own mental health, on their students and others' uh, mental health. So we've had about uh, 6,000 people take each of the two MOOCs, Learn and Teach, and uh, we're excited they're free um, with an option to uh, purchase a certificate. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And a question from Paul, how has mental health educational guidance changed with the forced learning from home online? 
We've had some very interesting challenges, uh, we as an education system, uh, with uh, remote learning. And I think we're just starting to uncover uh, some of the influences or some of the impact. And I think that's going to be a big challenge in uh, our system of education on campus as well as in the school system. Um, certainly having contact uh, through Zoom or whatever means, if it's part-time attendance in the school system, is critically important to tapping into uh, and hearing about what's been going on and really attending to social emotional learning. So I think that's going to be a challenge for all of us to make uh, SEL a, a focus for our work in the days ahead. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. And, and just before we move on, um, I do want to mention, uh, I think the Faculty of Education uh, in the development of the MOOCs, these MOOCs, I'm going back to the, the Reconciliation Through Indigenous Education, has really demonstrated the power of online open learning. Uh, I, I've said in the past, these are the most unmook MOOCs that yeah. I've ever seen. And that's meant as, as a huge compliment because they don't suffer from a, a, a lot of the other um, sort of criticisms of, of large numbers of courses that were produced in the last uh, five or so years to be, uh, to be open and online. Uh, and I think this is building on that uh, tremendous success. So uh, it's fantastic to see from, uh, from, from the Faculty of Education getting that element of, uh, of education so, uh, so right. Good. Uh, okay, so now I am challenged because Deborah Butler's slide has animations in it. So Deborah, you'll have to tell me when you would like me to advance and build up your slide. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, you know what, go ahead and just put the whole thing up there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and that would make life easy. Um, yeah, thank you, Simon. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, so my research is in education, and one finding in my own and others' work is that students can't take intentional, deliberate control over their learning unless they have a clear vision of what they're trying to do, what their purpose is. And unfortunately, in post-secondary learning, sometimes the quality of thinking and learning processes we're after remains kind of implicit. Um, and it's not explicitly explained. And this is particularly problem if, we're uh, problem if we're trying to create inclusive spaces where we have students coming together with a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences who might not understand what we see as learning in our context. Um, so in this slide, which I show at the start of all my courses actually, I try to make visible to students what I'm expecting where I've landed as an instructor for their learning. So I kind of explain to them, okay, this is how I think learning works. And then I say, and so this is why I set up your assignments as I do. This is what you'll see. And actually often students are surprised when I actually say, well, I have a rationale for what it is that I'm asking you to do. Um, it's not enough, though, to show this kind of slide and say, okay, carry on, just do this. What we also do in the first course is actually take an assignment that they need to do that exemplifies these qualities, and they have to look at it, talk about it together, um, think about it, and interpret how it would show and get them involved in these kinds of learning processes. And what I find when I do this in terms of value is that that time invested at the outset in having them um, think about what they're supposed to be doing and interpret activities. And I continue that, one of the other questions, continue that throughout the course and the feedback I give in the way that we always think about assignments. It results in much um, deeper thinking and learning across the entire term. Thank you. And a question from Ramon. Do you find students are more likely to engage after you have explained why you evaluated them in a particular way? Absolutely. And I feel like that it, it demystifies what I'm asking them to do and gives them a sense of purpose underlying it. And also, and because of the way I do that, it's active, constructive, it's their personal meaning making, I think it hooks in with them and gives them a bit of permission to actually work actively with ideas. So I think it's motivating on that front. And also, I think that clarity of how to channel their efforts effectively really does help students to understand what they're being asked to do, but also kind of buy into why this is useful for their own learning. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Okay, next up, Zoe soon. Thank you. This has been so exciting and interesting. Uh, in this slide, I 
basically pasted in as many of my favorite teaching and learning activities as I could. I basically wanted to give a sense of the active learning, student-centric lessons I try to design for my students with the goal of helping them understand and remember all the tricky concepts. I teach really large classes of first, second, and third year human kinetics and nursing students. And I'm very conscious of creating lessons that have many facets, so visual, auditory, read, write, kinesthetic components, in an attempt to appeal to and be valuable for a wide variety of learner. And these aspects have also been designed to have a fun aspect and encourage students to work together in an engaging and stress-free environment. So to be honest, I also like that these activities involve communication and collaboration and student movement. They say that sitting is the new smoking and student movement and active learning lends itself well to promoting healthy living, as well as sending blood flow to the brain and contributing to that boost of energy and spirit as well as camaraderie, camaraderie that I like to see in the classes between the students. Um, so thank you, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Zoe. Um, so many questions I'd like to ask about your, your 16 different things, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it to others in the chat. Um, from Christina, um, for some reason in particular, the sensory deprivation escape room intrigues her. <laughs> uh, for this one, we were uh, creating, so what I did is I wanted to create um, some empathy with the students in terms of what it felt like to age. So I teach a course on aging. And so when joints age, of course, they become stiffer, you lose range of motion. When you age, you lose um, sensory receptors in your skin, so tactile receptors. And of course, sensory receptors like vision and hearing, all those seem to degrade slightly as we age. So what we did, or what I did, is created a lot of different um, activities where some of these senses were deprived and a, a group of students had to complete a task to move on to the next task and then answer questions related to those senses and what they had learned. <laughs> I, I, thank you. I, I can't resist asking uh, a, an extra one from Wendy. Is the split P DNA milkshake edible? <laughs> yes, it is. Before you add the isopropyl alcohol, I suppose. Okay, right. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. Uh, Sean Thanks. Morris. Welcome, Sean. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I don't know most of you, but it's great to have this sense of community. I'm, I'm from the Northern Medical Program, so part of the Faculty of Medicine, but located in, at UNBC in Prince George. And so I chose this slide not because we're all necessarily concerned about the microanatomy of the liver, but because it represents a learning experience for me as a teacher. Um, uh, and this is a large group session um, where I thought I had a pretty good session at going, but students told me um, one particular year that uh, it was a bit confusing. And uh, so I looked back and realized that I was um, doing a lot of uh, explaining, but my slides weren't um, necessarily supporting that. And it wasn't really building in the way that it ought to have been. So I went back and put some effort into breaking down the concepts, explaining them at a more basic level and building up to this slide, which was sort of the culmination slide, um, explaining how all the different cell types work together to allow the liver to perform its various roles. And uh, it was well received. Um, and I, I guess that's all there's to say about that. Uh, just, um, I think it's important to be humble. Uh, as we go forward, having lots of teaching experience to continually be able to learn from our students. It is. Thank you, Sean, and thank you for, for recognizing uh, just how important reflection is to all of us as educators. And it's very easy to think that uh, with experience and, and, and over time, we've got it all figured out. But um, I'm sure many people uh, share that sense of what am I going to learn? from my students and from uh, from teaching this course this year. Carissa. And a question from Joanne. Uh, she's wondering how distributed, uh, sorry, wondering how distributed programs are thinking about the fall term being online. Oh my gosh, that's a big question. So um, 
it, there's so many players in a distributed program through the different layers of um, administrative leadership uh, and then the different site specific issues. So we're, most things are gonna be done asynchronously. Some things will be done synchronously online and very few things will be done in person. And there's a little bit of room to do those things differently at the different sites. So for example, we might get to do gross anatomy teaching, um, sorry, extra teaching in person in Prince George to give a bit of uh, value added to the students who are telling you have to come to Prince George even though most of it's going to be online and it looks like that won't be able to happen in Vancouver um, yeah so it's there's a lot of complicated conversations going on it feels a bit like walking up a snowy hill and sliding back um, almost as much as you're going forward at times but we're making progress and uh, it's a great team to be working with thank you Sean and thanks for uh, thanks for joining us uh, Paul Coven from Sauda School of Business. Thanks, Simon. Uh, and I echo what everybody has been saying. It's, uh, it's really stimulating. Uh, the only thing that would make it better would be being together, where we'd probably raise a glass afterwards. Um, the, sl the slide I've picked is illustrative of what I try to do uh, with my students in a lot of courses, is make them experiential quickly. Uh, this course, Technology Entrepreneurship, is a, it's a, it's a graduate course in the business school, but it's co-taught uh, with applied science, uh, and the students actually come from across the STEM disciplines. Um, and so I picked this slide uh, because, first of all, it's a simple icebreaker that quickly gets students engaged in learning by doing. You can do this within a few minutes of starting the first class. Um, and I know you've read the instructions by now, so I'm not rereading them. Um, uh, first, the, 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 what it aims to convey is that there are multiple problems and latent opportunities uh, waiting to be discovered and addressed by uh, innovators. I'm trying to get uh, uh, students to uh, define a problem that, that matters, that's real from observation, rather than one they made up in their dorm room. Um, and uh, it contributes to student learning because it shows them that they can be in control of what they work on. Uh, and it's the first stage of a series of connected activities. It leads them to then formalizing these as hypotheses that they then go out and either validate or invalidate through their research. Great. Thank you, Paul. And, and the, the suitcase, the duct tape suitcase is certainly, uh, certainly memorable uh, in terms of uh, anchoring that for, uh, for students. Okay, I'm going to keep us uh, keep us moving forward. Uh, Bruce Dunham from the Department of Statistics. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, Simon, and uh, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Thank you. Um, you know, it took me a long time as an educator to realize that the impact I have on student learning is only in as much as what I get the students to do. We learn by constructing and creating our own knowledge, not by consuming somebody else's. So my classes are now activity centered. I get students working in small groups and I go around attempting to coach students through activities uh, as they're trying and struggling to, to do things that I'm asking them to do. Now it struck me that as a crucial final step, what you might call a metacognitive step, you've got to take a step back and think, well, you know, what was I asked to do? Why was I asked to do this? And what did I learn? And in encouraging students to do this, uh, I hope that they move on to a state where they can integrate the knowledge that I hope they've taken from a particular activity and embed it in a way in their, that it builds on their existing knowledge to build a lasting and solid knowledge for them to take forward. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. There are a few pro <laughs> looking for questions in the chat. We seem to have devolved into a conversation about the merits of duct tape. Uh, thanks to, uh, to Paul's last, uh, there is a question there, Carissa. Do How I often you can come up with different answers to questions than you think the reasons are for doing this? You know, this is a personal thing. So this is a personal reflection. So actually on the activity afterwards, the students get my, get what I hope they might have taken, but I stress they have to come up with their own thing. This is something for them to make sense of their own knowledge and what they, what they took from what they were asked to do. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, Jude Walker. Okay, thank you, Simon, and it's great to see everyone. And um, I think these are one of the few opportunities we get to, to learn from people all across campus. And, to breaking down these silos. 
so I, I'll just get right into it. I feel, therefore I am, is a great insight of the neuroscientist Damasio. And I try to expand that in my teaching to we feel, therefore we learn. And what I've presented here is student work and the idea that we make art and we make meaning. In education, graduate students typically engage in seminar style flipped classroom learning with reading at home, discussing and asking questions in class and writing academic essays. And this also forms a large part of my teaching as a powerful way to learn critical thinking and engage in critical reflection. However, in recent years, I've also gotten students to make art, which engages the effective, imaginative and metaphorical and often allows students to process ideas and make connections more quickly and see things differently. And what you see here as a compilation of different students' art pieces. And these are not artists by any means. And, and where I think the magic happens is when students explain the ideas that are represented by these pieces, teaching each other difficult theoretical concepts and coming, and coming up with new ideas together. So I try to attempt to create brave, what I call brave classrooms by listening, questioning, and modeling vulnerability myself. So hopefully students can in turn take risks like doing these kinds of activities and go beyond their comfort zone and feel, create, and learn. Thank you, Jude. It's great to see the, just as people have said, the diversity of presentations and things here today, it's great to see the diversity in uh, what students produce and then have the opportunity to uh, explain why they chose to, uh, to undertake that particular, uh, particular creation. Uh, I am going to move us on, Chen Wang, Asian Studies. Hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, Simon, for the opportunity. So as you can see on my slides, I've chosen one, an, an instruction page for a one-on-one oral practice for students. Um, the slide is broken down into three parts. In the middle part, um, there is a Chinese test for everybody. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's, uh, I try to sneak in a few um, target words for students in reading about the details of the task. Um, they feel so proud of themselves that they can read Chinese instructions um, after two weeks of learning. Um, and the last part is for evaluation, to tell them it's, it's formative evaluation. You're focusing on finding out how you're doing and to find out feedback from your peers. Uh, but the more important part is that um, the first part, the learning objective. As you may be able to see on the slide, this is a one-on-one -on -one oral practice between one student and a volunteer of volunteer native speaker of Chinese. Um, the goal is to facilitate students uh, two types of competence. First is the communication skills, but the more important today is the inter intercultural competence um, that is aligned with UBC's uh, strategic plan of fostering global citizenship and the value of uh, respecting toward different people, idea, and actions. And I think this is, um, we have um, the luxury of doing this in a small class, a small language class where students can really talk. This is not only important for the, stu the learners themselves, but also for the international students, especially the uh, native Chinese speaking students here on campus to encourage them to step out of their comfort zone of engaging with, with the learner and to see um, who they are from the eyes of a learner of Chinese. Um, they feel proud of their, um, their language ability and then learn from how, about UBC from the learners that they communicate with. So I think it's just a, one of those activities where students actually get to talk with each other and explore um, an idea or language. Thanks. Thank you. A question from Agnes. Do you give students help with navigating the cultural differences that they uncover? Thank you. Um, we do give them guidance, but you will be um, thrilled to know that students actually have lots of questions that they want to navigate, um, but never had a chance. So um, I have students asking each other, but why do Chinese people always ask me age? Like, don't, don't they know that it's not polite to ask people their age? Um, so through the conversation between uh, individual students, they have their different perspectives. Uh, native speakers of Chinese complain to their peers saying, yeah, my parents does that all the time. I feel embarrassed. But you know what? That's common um, in a Chinese speaking country. They, they're showing you care. They wanted to um, know more about you. So they have their different ways of navigating. Um, I wanted to say that uh, giving them opportunity to, to converse um, is allowing them to navigate by themselves. 
Great. Thank you. Santo Singh. Thank you, Simon. And good to see everyone here. So why this slide? Um, this slide um, basically uh, use it for Biology 260. I'm just teaching that um, you know, during this uh, summer term. Uh, I also uh, use this same slide at my third year course and also sometimes the first year course as well. Uh, why I chose this slide? Simply because students have uh, through the service told me that this is one slide in which they really got interested in plants, in which uh, they learned a lot about the plants on a single slide. And I don't take any credit for this slide because I got contribution from hundreds of my students in the last five or six years who filled in the blanks. This slide, I bring it right in my first lecture and then towards the end when it's the final review time. The slide initially comes as a, just a canvas without anything written, just the basic leaf structure in the back. Um, it's a challenge to get students, students interested in plants because most of the students at the second year level we see are more interested into medicine or animal part of the physiology. So in order for, uh, to fill it in, we just asked them photosynthesis being one of the key aspects of plants. So I asked them about the, uh, this basic equation of photosynthesis, which I call it as a, an equation of, uh, of life, basically, as carbon dioxide and water being the re reactants um, in, in presence of sunlight makes oxygen and sugars. And then students split into groups. They could be either be called as a carbon dioxide group, water group, and so on. And they then develop this whole thing as to how plants are related to other species, how they are connected or how they can solve uh, the, the global uh, issues or global problems like food security up there, um, a, a, as well as the environmental climate change, sustainability, and so on. So they also look at how oxygen is important. It provides life not only to the plants, but also to the life of all the organisms uh, on this earth. So when they have done this part, then they uh, do further discussions on this, write papers, or in Biology 351 or 352, they then do research on finding more, uh, more answers to this. And I'll end it right here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Santok. Sounds like an entire course on one slide, or at least the potential for an entire course. Uh, absolutely, and we covered that in the end, um, you know, as, as well, which, which I'm going to do next week when, when it's the final lecture. Great, thank you. Agnes. Welcome. Hi, thank you. So a few years ago, Montreal dumped 8 billion liters of sewage into the river as part of a sewer repair. And the city said there was no other option but dumping the sewage. So in this activity, I challenged students to get creative and think of some other solutions. And I chose this slide because it lies at several intersections. It's from a course where engineering instructors teach non-engineering students. It's a practical problem where we get to apply our imagination and creativity, and it leads to a discussion about trade-offs. So what would you be willing to give up to prevent this? Money, land, personal comfort. Um, so the activity asks students to think critically about both the technological claims that they're hearing and the limitations imposed on engineering products, not only by the physics and the math, but by our values as a society. Perfect, thank you. Question, Carissa? What was the best solution and was it feasible from Paul? We've, yeah, I don't know, we've come up with the best one uh, or even very feasible ones. There have been things like uh, poopsicles on your porch in the winter and giant holes filling up Olympic Stadium with sewage, um, oil tankers. It's been very creative. And ultimately what we come up with is very expensive, very resource intensive. And what are we losing? by solving this problem in that way. Yeah, I love the, uh, the context and how, how you motivate the students' uh, interest in the, uh, in, the, in, in the topic. And that's a, certainly a theme that runs through several of the, the slides that we've seen. Okay, Susan, welcome Susan Nesbitt. Oh, thanks Simon and hi everyone. So this slide is a screenshot from an online course entitled Engineering and Sustainable Development. It's a, basically a self-study course that also has a, 
uh, is in parallel a, a sort of asynchronous discussion every week. Uh, the slide is the last learning moment in the material resources and productivity lesson, which is the first of five lessons in the sustainable supply chain module. You know, I'm sharing this slide because I really like that it is simple, short, I think it's visually engaging, uh, perhaps even playful and amusing, and it's also empowering and positive. It conveys the message that dematerialization is possible and that students have a critical role to play in achieving the UN sustainability goals, you know, for example, uh, the sustainable consumption and production goal. So with this slide, I'm striving to inspire students to continue with the module's lessons, uh, which aim to help students connect contextual issues like uh, sustainable development goals to their future environment, uh, sorry, engineering design decisions. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. I remember Radio Shack. I wanted to have a look at, zoom in on the slide to see all the, uh, all the items that you could buy once in a while. Great, thank you. Uh, Vita Chichnev. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and to have an opportunity to share my slide. This slide represents project-based learning that I have implemented in my upper-level Russian language course, Russian through film. And students learn the language while accomplishing a real research task on the Russian film of their choice. I believe this project facilitates learning because it is differentiated learning. The project is based upon the language proficiency and interests of each learner. Also, it is divided into a few assignments and students are guided uh, step by step to, until they uh, complete the project. Um, so it's some kind of scaffolding for learners. That's about it. Thank you. Great. Okay, I don't see uh, any questions. Uh, we'll move on to, this is the, the, the last presentation. This is not the feedback form for the event, should you feel like trying to all click A, uh, but Erin, welcome, please. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. I uh, thought I was a little bit out of place, just in terms of it, just this slide felt feels very different from the others. Um, but every time I show it in uh, the big intro chem classes, so I teach Chem 121 and Chem 123, where we put 200 students in a lecture hall and we just put them through their paces in terms of midterms and that sort of thing. And showing this slide, the class after the midterm, just makes the classroom roar, right? Like students are just talking with each other. They just cannot contain themselves. And uh, it's great because it creates a space for them to sort of share an emotional response to a stressful situation because midterms are stressful. And it just gives them a chance to connect and have sort of a cohesive moment in the room. It's uh, because our classes are so big, uh, it would really not be fair to sort of try to pick on an individual student and be like, how did you find the midterm? Um, whereas if you ask it as a clicker question, it's a way of getting everybody to participate and engage and uh, the students can acknowledge, oh, I struggled. I'm closer to E than to A. Um, and it's a way that if they do acknowledge their struggle, when we show the, or when I show the clicker results, so share the poll results, they can see that no matter what they chose, they weren't alone. And I like this because when they are going through and doing their discussions, it's a chance for them to share their struggles with their classmates, their victories with their classmates, and also sort of try to go through and reflect what are strategies that students use for this midterm and what will they use going forward or what could they use for the next one? Yeah, thank you. I, I, just before we get to a question, I think it demonstrates something else as well. I think it demonstrates the care from you as the instructor to actually want to know how they experienced it and presumably take action as a, as a result of that. So yeah. This is not something I would have asked in my first year of teaching, but it's something I'm comfortable asking now. Great. Marissa. And from Ramon, do you find asking clicker questions like this helps with the overall engagement and collaboration? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, questions like this very much, they encourage students to talk to their neighbor. And as soon as they start breaking that ice and sort of building up the 
um, connections with their classmates. It just, it helps uh, build that cohesive nature of the class. Yeah, it's, it's a relatively small thing. And I know many of us will do things like this in our teaching, but you know, cumulatively these small things can have, uh, can have a huge impact on uh, student engagement and a, and a sense of belonging. And I think we need that anyway in our, in our teaching. We need it even more now, given the, uh, the extraordinary circumstances that we find ourselves in. So that brings us to the end of the, uh, the presentation and, and up to the hour. I'll quickly hand back to Santa for any closing comments. Well, I'd just like to say that I'm simply blown away by the diversity of uh, ideas and approaches that all of you have employed uh, in your classes. And you can really see um, how extraordinary you are and uh, how in innovative you are, not just here at the university, but uh, across the, the country and, and, and globally. That last slide, Aaron, um, really hit home to me because of what you said about how you wanted to engage with your students at midterm and to ask them how the midterm was. And in, in many ways, uh, that made me think about this upcoming year and this past uh, several months. And another one of you actually spoke about um, how um, it's really important this annual meeting, uh, this celebration of teaching excellence, that, to learn from each other across both campuses, across many faculties, and to, to learn best practices and to, to share our struggles and to share our successes, just as is the case in that midterm in that class. And so, you know, you know what's happening this year is is extraordinary, and we are all struggling, myself included, and uh, um, we are going to have to challenge ourselves and in, in, in how to to motivate our students and to have, get them excited about each and every one of our fields, and and so probably a year from now would be a good time for us to use that slide and ask the same question of, of each of us. How, how was the year? Not how was the midterm, how was this year? And to share the challenges, the struggles, and the victories with each other. You know, if, if we look back at this year that's upcoming in the future when things return to normal, I'm almost certain that uh, this will be a year where we will have learned and grown a great deal as an institution and individually as teachers. And so I hope that one year from now when we're celebrating again, that uh, hopefully we can do it here at Norman McKenzie House and hopefully we can uh, listen to each other and learn from each other and thank each other for being there for our students and being there for this institution. And I just want to end with a, with a sort of a humorous note. Uh, Simon, when you uh, uh, invited Professor Singh to, uh, to speak, uh, I was sitting there and I thought you were calling on me because <laughs> our first names are so similar. But uh, yeah. just, I just want to end with that. And thank you all for being here today. And, and thank you all for everything that you do. Thank you, Santa, for those, uh, those concluding remarks. And thank you, everyone. We're a couple of minutes over, but that does conclude our event. Congratulations to all of you that have been recognized through awards, both within UBC and both of our 3M National Teaching Fellows, Paul Coven and Tiffany Potter, this year, who were both able to join us. Uh, we will be sending a follow-up email after the event. We'll make the link the recording and all of those slides with that fantastic rich array of ideas and information uh, available to all of you. So thanks very much. Stay safe, everyone.